Good morning, Life Bridge. Happy Mother's Day to all the mamas. Such an honor. I just want to thank my husband. I don't take it lightly that he entrusts me to share with you guys today. It's such an honor. I love you. He's my biggest encourager, my biggest fan. I feel like I can do anything. He like pep talked me back there earlier and I was like, all right, let's go. Let's go. Second service. And I just love you so much. And I'm so honored that you entrust me with the pulpit. It means the world. Um, I just want to touch on, I know you saw the announcement, Empower Night is July 26th. We are going to have Laura Allred with us. And if you don't know who she is, she is a powerhouse. She runs with Lou Engel. If you know Lou Engel, he's been around for a while. And she's from Trinity in Dallas. So we're going to have her with us that night. You can text EMPOWER to 903-307-2022. I'm going to tell you, get your ticket fast. We only had 30 seats available at our last Empower Night, and they have continued to grow with each one. So if you want to be in the room, because we will have to cut off registration, I hate to do it, until we blow this wall out and add more seating, we're going to have to cut off registration. So make sure that you get your ticket today. Are you all ready for the word? I have a message today, and it has been on my heart for the last two months. I've been in this story in the Bible for the last two months, just kind of studying it, and I haven't been able to get away from it. So we are going to be in the Old Testament today. We are in Judges chapter 4, and if you will stand for the honoring of God's Word. We're going to get our Bible reading in today. We have 23 verses, so hang in there, and then I'm going to let you sit down, okay? <laughs> Judges 4, one. And again the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, now that Ehod was dead. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Sisera, the commander of the army, was based in Heroshith Higoyim. That was good, right? Give me some props. I've been working on that all week. (laughs) Because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried to the Lord for help. Now Deborah a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, the son of Abinamah, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, go take with you 10,000 men, to Naphtali and Zebulon and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Certainly I will go with you, said Deborah. But because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours. For the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. There Barak summoned Zebulon and Naphtali, and the 10,000 men went up under his command. Deborah also went with him. Now Heber, the Kenite, had left the other Kenites and the descendants of Hobab, Moses' brother-in-law, and pitched his tent in the great, at the great tree of Zananim near Kadesh. When they told Sisera about Barak, son of Abaman, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera summoned from Heroshith Higoyim to the Kishon River all his men in his 900 chariots fitted with iron. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots in the army by the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled on foot. Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Heroshith Hagoyim, and all Sisera's troops fell by the sword. Not a man was left. Sisera, meanwhile, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. Y'all, if y'all don't know Jael yet, 
Y'all about to know Jael. <laughs> because there was an alliance between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the family of Heber, the Kenite. Jael went out to meet Sisera and told him, Come in, my lord. Come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent, and she covered him with a blanket. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened a skim of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone there, say no. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quickly to him while, she, while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground, and he died. Just then Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera, and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you are looking for. So he went in with her, and there lay Sisera with a tent peg through his temple, dead. On that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, before the Israelites. Sounds like a Mother's Day message to me. <laughs> Can you tell your neighbor the title of my message this morning? Not up in here. <laughs> now tell your other neighbor with a little more sass, not up in here. <laughs> Let's pray. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for your presence that's in this room. Holy Spirit, will you anoint my lips? The revelation that you gave me, Father God, will you help me to communicate it properly, Father God, to your people? Open our, our hearts today. Remove any blinders and any walls in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You can be seated. So, this is not a typical Mother's Day message. Not your normal, common Mother's Day message. But I feel like there's a point sometimes we have to get to where we step out of the common to make room to be set apart for seeing the uncommon. And so today, you're not going to be putting hashtag tent peg through the temple on your Mother's Day photos, but we're going to have a good time. <laughs> so over the last month, like I said, I haven't been able to pull away from this text because if you look around you, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, whether you watch the news or you're involved in anything, to see that we're living in unprecedented times. To see that the world around us is not the world that we grew up in. No matter how old you are, you can look back at your childhood and look at the children today and see completely different things that they're struggling with that maybe you had no knowledge of at your age. And what you have to understand is there's a war happening. Whether you like it or not, whether you want to believe it or not, there is a spiritual war happening in our nation and in our world today. There's a war happening for you, for your loyalties, for your destiny, for your legacy, for your generational line, for your marriage, for your house, for your children. There is a war happening, and there is a great war happening on the family unit, especially the family unit in this hour that we live. If you don't believe me, I want to read to you. This is the roots of the modern-day feminist movement. This is their manifesto. If you don't think that the enemy is after the family unit, once you hear this, this will change your mind. The modern-day feminist movement was started by 12 influencers in New York City, all of them well-educated, successful, wealthy, influential models, Ivy League college graduates, the who's who of New York society. This is the recorded feminist manifesto that was chanted before each meeting that they had. Why are we here today, the chairwoman asked. To make revolution, they answered. What kind of revolution, she replied. The cultural revolution, they chanted. And how do we make cultural revolution, she demanded. By destroying the American family, they answered. How do we destroy the American family, she came back. By destroying the American patriarch, they cried exuberantly. And how do we destroy the American patriarch? By taking his power. How do we do that? By destroying monogamy. How can we destroy monogamy? By promoting promiscuity, eroticism, prostitution, abortion, 
and homosexuality. That is the roots of the feminist movement. Hear me, as a woman, I believe women are powerful. I'm all for women and supporting each other and doing hard things and doing great things. But here, isn't that like the enemy? To take a little bit of truth and then mix it in with lies. The enemy loves to hide major agendas in small lies, in small truths, I'm sorry. This comes with a little bit of lies mixed with truth. And today, sadly, we've seen a lot of this sneak into the church. Because if you look inside the church, there's a lot of mixture. Our society today welcomes the idea that truth and inner peace is whatever you want it to be. Live your best life. Whatever you feel that's true, whatever you feel, do that. But we know that truth is a person. At least that's what my Bible says. That truth is a person. And he told, Jesus never said for us to live our best life. He said those that lose their life will find it. So we see mixture in the church. We even see it in our conversations. I see it a lot in Facebook posts. I'm sending prayers and good vibes. Nowhere in my Bible does it say to send good vibes. Do you know what that, is, like, originated in the 1960s and 70s in the hippie movement, which the source of that is rebellion and tolerance? Do you see the mixture? Prayers and good vibes. And I'm going to get a lot of hate on this one because I got a lot of hate on Facebook for it. Christians practicing yoga. Yoga is a Hindu spiritual practice. I'm all for stretching. I probably, I probably need to stretch more. I'm all for stretching. But when you're doing yoga, you are literally opening the door. I watched an interview from an ex-psychic who was like dabbling in the occult. She said in order to speak to evil spirits, she would do yoga because it opened the door for her to be able to speak to them. We see it in horoscopes. New ageism practices mixed with scripture and biblical beliefs. We see practice of the presence of spiritual energy in physical objects like healing rocks and crystals, tarot cards, and psychic readings. But maybe that's not something that you're into, like, you're like, oh, that's not for me. Okay. Let me put it in your world for a second. Gossip is a source of mixture. Why? Because it's witchcraft. Because you're literally operating in a spirit opposite of Christ, an anti-Christ spirit, and speaking lies over people. It's witchcraft. <laughs> I didn't get many amens on that one. It's okay. <laughs> I'm coming in hot today. Y'all are just going to have to hang with me. If you have any problems, you can send emails to my husband. He put me up here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But we hear a lot of times, God knows my heart. He knows my heart. Okay. But do you know his? Because if you know his heart, you'll have conviction on the things that you're doing. He'll be able to put his finger on things in your life that need to go. And then you don't have to use the excuse, God knows my heart. Somewhere in the church, we've allowed mixture, tolerance, and complacency, and we've thrown out consecration, consecration altogether because that's legalism. That's religious. It's not legalism. It's love. We're claiming to be followers of Jesus, but living a lifestyle of casual Christianity that worships God on Sunday. We're really good at worshiping God on Sunday, and then we go and live like hell through the rest of the week. Worshipping idols of pornography. Dealing with secret sin. Cussing. <laughs> I know that this is all like hard stuff, but I'm coming after it today. Idols of lust. Greed. Work, 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 work. That's not godly. <laughs> the word casual by definition is the lack of emotional commitment, the lack of seriousness, and the lack of loyalty. 
though many of us don't think of it this way, casual, casualness mostly focuses on me, doing what makes me comfortable, what fits my schedule, what fulfills my agenda, even if there's a little mixture in there. And then we wonder why there's a lack of demonstration of the power of God in our churches. Because he's going to pour out his spirit on a consecrated bride. That's not full of spiritual mixtures. And it's my fear as believers that we become too passive, too desensitized. How do you know if you're desensitized? When you're scrolling Facebook and you see yet another school shooting. And that something doesn't happen on the inside of you where your heart breaks and it leads you into a place of intercession for our kids, for our schools, and for our nation. That's when you're desensitized, when you can continue to scroll past that as if it's just another day. And the problem with mixture is you forget what you're actually called to possess. When people forget what belongs to them spiritually, they lose their warrior heart, they lose their fight, and they become casual and complacent. Church, we cannot afford to be casual in this hour. Mamas, we cannot, be, we cannot afford to become casual in what we allow our kids to watch. On those tablets, on the phones, on their TVs, we cannot become casual. Because... We are responsible for teaching them what purity is. If we don't teach them, the world will. We cannot become casual in what we allow in our homes and through our doors. We have to shake off this sleepwalking Christianity that we've somehow fallen into. Revival in the church is just the overflow of revival in our homes. It starts at home. It starts with us. And it's time to get to a place of, mm-mm, mm-mm, not up in here. No, no, no. You ever told your kid that? They come home from their friend's house acting crazy. Oh, sweet baby. No, 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 not up in here. You may have gotten away with that over there, but not up in here, not in this house. It's time to go to war for our bloodline and for our homes. Which brings me to our text. Our text starts in dark times in Israel. God's people are actually living in the promised land. They're worshiping God, but they're also worshiping idol gods, Canaanite idol gods. Do you see the mixture here? And we see how serious God is about mixture. Because it says that he turned them over into the hands of King Jabin. And he oppressed them for 20 years. But then it says that the people cried out for help. And this is where we're introduced to Deborah. Many of us know Deborah. If you've been raised around church, we know who Deborah is. I love Deborah personally. She's like one of my favorite ladies in the Bible. She was a judge for the nation of Israel. So what judges would do in times of peace is they would handle disputes and like personal things. But in a time of that the people needed deliverance, they became the warrior rescuer. So Deborah wasn't just a judge though. She was also a prophetess, and we see that she calls for Barak and shares with him what the Lord had said, to call out 10,000 warriors to go to Mount Tabor. I will call out Sisera, commander of the King Jabin's army, along with his chariots and warriors to the Kishon River. There I will give you victory over him. And I want to point out something here because y'all know how I feel about reading the Bible. You cannot just read the Bible. The Bible is alive. It's active. You have to read the Bible and ask questions. What is the significance of where they're at? What is the significance of this name? What is the significance? Ask the Holy Spirit. Read with him. And so I love this because I had to look up the significance of the place where they were battling at, Mount Tabor. And if you look up the name, Mount Tabor means brokenness. Why is this significant? Because the first place revival starts in us is at a place of brokenness. It's a place of complete surrender. It's a place where we are completely humbled before the Lord. 
Psalms 51 says, the sacrifice he desires is a broken spirit. He will not reject a broken and repentant heart. And Mount Tabor is actually the same mountain that we see the transfiguration of Jesus. Because it's brokenness that produces change. As we continue to read, Barak says to Deborah, I'll go, but only if you come with me. Deborah says she will go with him, but lets him know that because of his partial obedience, the outcome changes. The victory will be given into the hands of a woman. And this is why full obedience is required. Partial partial obedience is still disobedience. (laughs) Because there are things the Lord wants to do through you, but if we want it on our terms and in our comfort zones, we miss the full reward. And I don't want to be one that said, I let fear rob me of the full reward and all that he had called to me because I was uncomfortable. Now Heber, the Kenite, was le- had left the other Kenites and pitched his tent by the great tree near Kadesh. And now we meet Heber. Oh, Heber. That name, Heber. (laughs) If you're looking for a boy baby name, there you go. (laughs) Heber was a Kenite, and he had an incredible lineage. He was actually a descendant of Moses, which is really cool. And so Heber had made an alliance with the evil king Jabin. Why is this an issue? Because Heber is an Israelite, and King Jabin is a Canaanite who had been oppressing the Israelites for 20 years, but we see that Heber makes an alliance with him. Heber comes from a powerful lineage, but he has chosen to forfeit his inheritance because he has aligned himself with the enemy's camp. He left his tribe of the Kenites. He doesn't want to be with his people, but it says that he pitched his tent near Kadesh, which would actually put Heber right at the edge of the enemy's territory. But He's still technically in Israel, so he hasn't completely abandoned his people. He hasn't completely abandoned the God of his people, but he just doesn't want to be closely associated with. Do you see the mixture here? Do you see where Heber is on the fence? He has one foot in each territory, and he's loyal to no one. What's fascinating fascinating about Heber's name, though, is his name actually means partner. He's called to be a partner and an ally, but we see him operating in his spirit opposite of who he's called to be. He's called to be a partner and an ally, but he's loyal to no one. We are in the hour more than ever of the sifting. The Lord is looking for those who will partner with him who are completely sold out for him, not people of mixture, consecrated, and with an alliance to the one true king. In verse 16, verse 16, Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Harosheth Hagoyim, and all Sisera's troop fell by the sword. Not a man was left. But we see Sisera, meanwhile, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, because there was an alliance between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the family of Heber the Kenite. Why did, why did Sisera feel comfortable going to Jael's tent? Because he knew of the alliance that Heber had made. Are you hearing this? The enemy felt comfortable to come into Jael's tent, into her home, because of, a, of an alliance that had been made in her family. And now we meet Jael. I think, I honestly think, She's my favorite now. I really do. What we know about the Kenites is that they're nomadic people. So that just means that they live in tents and they just kind of travel around. And so the women are actually responsible for the tent. The men would do, they were herders. They worked with metal, farming. They did like the agricultural stuff. But the women were responsible for the tent. They would put the tent up. They would tear the tent down. They would keep the tent maintained and cleaned. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I need to clean my tent today. (laughs) But the women were responsible for the tents. Everything that had to do with the tent, that was their responsibility. 
So Sisera knew that he had been given access to Jael's tent. And what's fascinating about Sisera's name, if you look up the name, his meaning, it means meditation and keen and swift. And isn't like that like the enemy, to be swift? So he enters and he, she assures him that he's safe there. And this is the part where I struggled with this text because I'm like, Jael, why would you even let him in your tent? Like, take him out right there. Like, how cool would it be if this story, if he's like, comes to the door and she's just like, wow, right in his, like, neck and he's done. And it's easy and there's no blood on the rug. We're good. Like, everything's great. But <laughs> JL was strategic. Because he's the army commander, he would definitely have taken her out. Like, come on. He's, like, the guy. He would have taken her out. So she had to be strategic. And that's how spiritual warfare is in our homes. We have to be very strategic. We know that the enemy is strategic. We know that he's organized, that he's not just all chaotic. He's organized. He's regimented. So we must be even more strategic in how we war against the enemy. So he asks for water, and instead she levels him up, gives him some milk. Because what's milk do? Makes you sleepy. Good job. Good job, guys. <clears throat> so she gives him milk. And so worn out from battle, now full of milk, Sisera asks Jael to watch from the door while he sleeps. And if anyone asks if he's there, to say no. But then we see Jael, where her tent has taken a stance of neutrality, of mixture, of complacency. We see her grab her hammer and her tent peg. And she says, not up in here. Not up in here. So what's significant about the, the hammer and the tent peg? JL grabbed what she had authority and power to use. She, ha she used what she had access to, what she knew how to use. And we have to remember that our God has power and authority and that we are made in the image of God. So that means that we have been given power and authority. The angels have power, but they don't have authority. They have to wait on someone who has authority to send them on an assignment. How do the demons get power? Because we are, How do they get authority? Because we know that they haven't been given it. How do they get authority? We give it to them. We are the only ones that can discard and throw away our authority. Luke 10, 19. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall hurt you. James 4, 7. Submit yourself, therefore, therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. 2 Corinthians 10, 3, 4. For though we walk by flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not flesh, but they are divine power to destroy strongholds. Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and the end of the earth. Matthew 6.19, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. We have authority and we've been given power. And church, it's time. We are in the days that we have to take back our authority and take back the power so that we can come against the schemes of the enemy and take back our homes, take back our marriages, take back our children. We have to take back our authority. When you become complacent, you give up your authority. Did you know that you don't let night terrors, you don't have to deal with night terrors. You don't have to wake up feeling like you're being suffocated because of anxiety. It's time to grab your hammer and your tent peg. You don't have to tiptoe around spirits in your house. It's time to grab your tent peg and your hammer. Gen Z, you don't have to have a narrative of anxiety. You don't have to have a narrative of addiction. It's time to grab your hammer and your tent peg. It's time that we take our authority back, church. So J.L. grabs the hammer and the tent peg. She creeps up to him as he sleeps. 
and she drove the tent peg through his temple and into the ground. Do you see the prophetic picture here? She wasn't just gruesomely trying to kill him. She was putting a stake in the ground. From this day forward, devil, you can't have my house. You can't have my marriage. You can't have my kids. You can't have my city. She put a stake in the ground. Alondra, you can go ahead and come up to the keys. So as we were preparing for Mother's Day, you know, we do a gift for the moms every, every year. And I didn't want to just do a coffee mug that said mama on it. If you got me one of those, it's okay. I mean, they're really cool. I've always wanted one, so it's fine. But I didn't want to just give you a coffee mug that said mama. I didn't want to give you just a necklace. I wanted to give you tent pegs. Not literal tent pegs. Don't freak out, husbands. <laughs> I felt the air leave the room. <laughs> but I wanted to not just prepare a message and tell you, give you a charge today, but I wanted to actually equip you and empower you to take back your home. Because the bottom line is, if you're not praying one violent prayer a day over your, over your marriage, over your house, over your children, you're not warring for your bloodline. And what I love about JL is she was ready. This wasn't a spur of the moment, last minute idea. I believe that this was a premeditated plan. She knew the day that the enemy came to her door, she would be ready. She had a strategy. As sure as y'all can go ahead and come up. So today we're equipping you with strategy. I'm gonna have all the moms stand in just a minute. But in these bags, we have, they're super cute, because obviously they had to be. We have little anointing oil bottles for you. And they're pink. But included with those is a QR code that you can scan. And it's like, I think, 20 to 30 pages of prayers and confessions for your house, for your marriage, for your children. They even have rebellious children prayers in there. Hallelujah. There's prayers for husbands to pray over your wives. There's prayers in there for wives to pray over your husbands. You got to get your hammer and your tent peg. Because the enemy is after the identity of our children. The identity of your spouse. And I think here in Texas, we often think that what's happening in California where kids whose parents aren't affirming their gender choice, they're being ripped from their parents by the state, taken for days, maybe even weeks. Parents have no idea where they're at. And then they come back and they have had a sex change that has paid for by the state. And if you think that we're not on the brink of that because we live in East Texas, social media alone has sunk its teeth into a generation and it's knocking at our door. We cannot stay in sleepwalking Christianity. We cannot stay casual. We cannot turn an eye to what's happening around us just because it's not here in your house right now. Because the days are only going to get darker. We have to be ready. So today, if all the moms would stand up. When I was preparing this message, I heard the Holy Spirit say that this isn't a message, it's a charge. It's a call to action. And as I was in prayer, I think it was on Tuesday, I heard the Holy Spirit say, that we're coming into the days where the mama bears are coming out of hibernation. 
where this tolerance and this blind eye that has been turned to what's happening in our world, that mama bears are waking up and they're taking back their authority. They're grabbing their tent peg and they're putting a stake in the ground for their homes, for their cities, for the schools. And it's not, they're not bound by fear any longer, but there's this courage that's coming up on the inside of us to war and to battle because we are called to it. Light invades darkness. It doesn't wait for darkness to tire out. Light invades. And so we're called to invade the dark places. My heart for you today is to empower and equip you, to charge you to anoint your homes, to plead the blood of Jesus over your spouse and your children, to pray over them when they're sick, to anoint them with oil. It's time to grab our hammer and our tent peg. So with every eye closed, those mamas that are standing, if you'll lift your hand, I'm going to pray over you and I'm going to give you a charge. Father God, I thank you for every hand that is lifted, every generational line that is represented by every hand that is lifted in this room. I declare over you right now in the name of Jesus that every assignment of the enemy that has been sent out over your children, over your house, over your marriage, and over your family line is broken now in the mighty name of Jesus. And I cancel every assignment and I plead the blood of Jesus from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. And Father God, I pray that you are dispatching angels now to their homes, to their children now in the mighty name of Jesus. And I just hear, thank you, Holy Spirit. I feel like I need to encourage one that's maybe you've been warring and you've been giving it to God and you've been believing for that child or you've been believing for your spouse. Let me tell you the power of prayer. Just a quick story of my testimony. My mom was an IV drug user. She got pregnant with me out of the one night stand, scheduled an abortion for me. The day before the abortion, my mom was using. And in the middle of her using, she cried out to God, God, if you're real, just save me and my baby. And in an instant, she was delivered completely from drugs and sober and in her right mind. And then so I, I wasn't, I was raised in the church. I was raised up in the things of God. But then I got to high school. And I ran away from the call. I knew at the age of nine, the Holy Spirit had called me into ministry. He told me I was going to be a pastor's wife at the age of nine. So I knew the call that was on my life. But in high school, I ran. I did things. Hung out with people I shouldn't have. I ran from God. But my mama never stopped praying for me. From the moment that she encountered God, she never stopped praying for me. And today, I'm walking in the call that I was given at age nine because of a mama who kept praying in the midst of her child doing things that was opposite of what they were called to. So if that's you today and you're believing for a child, do not quit warring and fighting for them. Do not stop praying and covering them and dispatching angels around them because the power of prayer, it works. So I'm going to charge you today. Go to war for your home. Shake that casual mixture mentality off of your life. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Ask someone in the body to help you. And begin to war for your family and for your children. Because it's time. It's time to wake up. The hours are short. We don't have much time left. And we have work to do. So bow your heads. I'm going to close. Father God, I thank you for every family represented here. Holy Spirit, I pray a blessing over every household. I pray, Father God, for divine strategy on how to lead their children, how to raise them. I pray, Father God, that you're imparting even strength now where there has been, where it has felt heavy and they have felt weak. I declare over you right now that strength is coming to your physical body, but also to your spirit in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you're giving clarity of heaven 
over these parents, over these mamas, and a supernatural peace. Holy Spirit, we love you and we honor you in this house. Would we not leave from this place the same? Mark us today. Yes, it's Mother's Day. Yes, it's a great day of celebration, but we don't want to leave the same just because it's a holiday. Mark us today that we can mark it on the calendar. It was that day that everything shifted in my home. It was on Mother's Day 2024 that everything changed in my house and I took back my authority. Thank you, Jesus. We honor you in this house. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. We love you. Happy Mother's Day. Go eat something really, really good. I love you.